the show that airs daily at 11 a.m. Pacific time right here on YouTube. I am your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people just like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Back by Popular Demand is a dear friend and a wonderful speaker, Dr. Hans Deal. And today he is going to be talking about how you can reverse heart disease with your knife and fork. Please welcome back to the show, Dr. Hans Deal. Hello, glad to be with all of you. What you got for us today? Well, <laughs> I uh, wanted to share with you that uh, recently I was invited to speak to a group of lawyers and the topic assigned to me was uh, how to kill your husband without getting caught. And you know, the place was absolutely packed. It was very obvious. Everybody was kind of curious and interested in the topic. And then I said to them, the answer, the solution to your issue is very, very simple. It's very effective. It's time honored. No one has ever been caught. No need to hire an assassin. All you have to do is get yourself a fork and a knife and practice the typical standard American diet. What about this diet? It's fabulous in taste. It's elegant in its setting. It's sophisticated. It's admired. And to many, it's a loving thing to do, expressing love and admiration through food. And it's addictive. It's called the American diet, the standard American diet. It's rich in calories, rich in salt, sugar, and fat, and cholesterol, and poor in nutritional value very poor in fiber and also very poor in nature's actual foods such as fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes. These are nature's foods, very, very minimally used in the standard American diet today. And so it's very interesting. This is the very diet that is envied around the world. And so what I want to do, I want to show you a, a kind of a look behind the scenes. I want to show you some of the underlying pathology. I want you to see what is really the cause and the, uh, the reason behind uh, heart disease. I want to show you atherosclerotic plaques. I want to show you a disease process that's progressive, stealthy, insidious and treacherous. It's a disease that progresses gradually, but ultimately it takes your life. It is the number one killer in the world today, heart disease. And yet, can we do something about it? Let's take a look. I first woke up, so to speak, when I was working on the anesthesia service, learning how to put people to sleep. And I was seeing my patients for the next day's surgery for coronary artery bypass surgery in order to bypass clogged arteries in their heart. Because it was late at night, I drew the man's blood test. And when I took the blood to the laboratory and had it processed, I couldn't believe my eyes. Now, normally, this liquid layer floating on top of the blood clot is quite transparent. It's a yellow, but quite clear. You can see right through it. The blood in this patient's tube, however, was anything but clear. The serum floating on his clot was thick and greasy white. It looked like glue. In fact, it stuck to the sides of the blood tube when I shook the tube. I went back to the patient. I said, Mr. Phillips, did you eat before you came to the hospital tonight? He said, yes. I said, what did you have? He said, I had a cheeseburger and a milkshake. And when he said that, I realized that what I was looking at in his tube was all the fat in the beef burger, all the butter fat in the cheese and the butter fat in the ice cream and in the milkshake. And all this fat had oozed out into his blood and actually turned his blood fatty. Well, 30, 40, 50 years of keeping your blood very fatty creates changes in the blood vessels that are very dangerous. Over the years, arteries can become clogged with fatty material. Then a blood clot can form, blocking the blood flow completely. If the artery leads to the heart, the lack of oxygen can cause heart muscle to die. That's a heart attack. If the clogged artery leads to the brain, the patient has a stroke. 
The next morning, we took Mr. Phillips to the operating room, and I put him to sleep, and the surgeon opened up his chest. And from these arteries, he began pulling out yellow, greasy deposits of fatty material called atherosclerosis. Did, I first woke up. Did you see that? Unbelievable. Atherosclerosis, a gradual narrowing of the arteries. You see, when it comes to heart disease, the real issue here is not so much the heart muscle, but the coronary arteries that you see there on the slide. These arteries become narrowed down, and when they get blocked, it uh, interrupts the blood flow on oxygen flow to the heart muscle, and the heart muscle actually suffers from a cardio, you know, a vascular event, uh, a myocardial infarction. This is what a heart attack is. Uh, many people have no idea, and many people think, well, I probably get some, uh, first I get some symptoms, so I know that it's going to come one of these days. No, 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 no. For many, many people, the first sign of heart disease, of the narrowing of the arteries, the first sign of heart disease is sudden death. That's incredible. People don't realize that. And, and we hear about even some famous actors that that's exactly how they died. Yeah. And, and you know, after that, there's not much you can do anymore, right? So it is very important to do something now. See, this is what happens. This is the cross-section of a coronary artery. You see, this belongs to a 47-year old truck driver. There's only about 35% of the luminal space, the inner space left. Everything else is occluded, uh, narrowed down with cholesterol buildup and calcium buildup and fat buildup. And so here you see, this is then a, 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 a picture of how the narrowing process uh, progresses. We're born with clean arteries. There is no obstruction there. But by the time we're 20 years of age, we already have 20% narrowing. At the age of 45, 60% narrowing. And by the time we're 70 years of age, most of us have about 80, 90% narrowing. And you have no symptoms until it strikes death. Now, this kind of a process called atherosclerosis is not only limited to the coronary arteries, but it's also limited, as you can see here, to the cerebral arteries in the brain, the arteries to the, to the uh, eyes, the arteries to the ear, the arteries to the kidneys, the arteries to uh, the legs, the arteries to the, uh, the, uh, the, the male sex organ. So you have impotence. Impotence is one of the early signs that narrowing of the arteries is taking place. So, you know, this is something to be, to be thought about, isn't it? And then people have often wondered, well, what are some of the risk factors for this underlying disease process called atherosclerosis? How do I know that I'm at risk? Well, here's what research has taught us over the last 80 years. It has taught us that there are three major factors that drive this disease. And they're indicated by the cholesterol number you see on top of the arch there. Then you have high blood pressure and you have smoking. These are three cardinal factors. Any cholesterol, total cholesterol above 150 is putting you at risk. Smoking, high blood pressure. And then you have on the left side, diabetes, obesity, then these blood fats called triglycerides. And on the right hand side, you have an inactive lifestyle and stress and perhaps some genetics. Please note, of these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lifestyle factors, one, two, three, four, five have a star. That means five out of eight are under the control of our diet. Diet, our lips have a lot to do with our diseases. And yet people have the idea sometimes that, well, you know, we have always had a heart disease, isn't that right? Well, not really. Here you see a major medical textbook that was written in 1928. And here's the prognosis. You can expect one heart attack a year in an average hospital in an average sized town. Hello? Unbelievable. That's really unbelievable, isn't it? I mean, when you found a heart attack in a patient, in a person, at that time, after World War I, you would call all the medical students, you would all call the doctors to look at this unusual case where a heart had been attacked. Heart attacks. Very, very rare disease about 100 years ago. Today, 
we face 3,000 heart attacks a day with cardiovascular disease, that's heart disease and stroke responsible for every third death. And people think, well, you know, maybe, yeah, this is an America, we're a rich country, we have these rich diets and we have smoking and stress and so on. But what about the rest of the world? Well, let me tell you, the rest of the world has been catching up very, very fast in the last 20, 30, 40 years. These countries that didn't have heart disease before in these developing countries, they would actually be very envious of the American diet, the American lifestyle, and they begin to copy it. They would bring American foods in. And today, heart disease is the number one killer around the world. So this is pretty sad that we are actually exporting our diseases through the lifestyle that we offer to people that is becoming so desirable to them. And so here you see a little bit of how the diet has changed over time. Uh, you see here the green bar, this represents the unrefined starchy foods like potatoes and the whole grains and corns and so on. And as you go over time, you notice below the graph, there's a GDP, this is the income of a society. As the society becomes more affluent, the unrefined uh, starchy foods, the grains, become less and less and less and less. At the same time, on the bottom, you see the red colors, the animal fats and oils and fats become more and more and more and more as the country becomes more affluent. And then the yellow bars, that's sugar. We had some sugar uh, at any time, but please note, it is an increased, increased, increased at the same time we'd see the same trend in animal protein in particular. So we have now a diet on the right-hand side. This is the American diet, where you have a lot of fats, the red ones, you have a lot of sugar, and then you have excessive amount of protein at the expense of the once unrefined starchy foods that have now become white flour products. So take a look, this is the American diet. I show it to you in a different manner here by helping you to see what has happened. We see two major dietary shifts, particularly in the last 30, 40, 50 years in America, where food has been changed from food to industrialized products. We don't eat potatoes anymore, we eat potato chips. We don't eat, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, we, we, we used to drink water and now we drink soda pop. Uh, we have shifted from beans to burgers. We have shifted from slow food to fast food. We have shifted from eating at home to eating out. And so with that, you've seen a dramatic shift in these empty calories. Empty meaning they have very little nutritional value. And so please note, the diet today, rich in sugar and fats and oils and alcohol, today represents 44% of all the calories that we eat in America. 44% have virtually no nutritional value. They have very little fiber and they're very high in calories. So that's one of the big shifts in our diet. But then there's another shift and that has to do with the consumption of meat. And here again, you see an almost doubling in the meat consumption over the last 100 years, particularly in the last 30, 40 years as we have shifted from red meat to white meat. So we more, uh, more, chicken than ever before, all swelling the amount of meat in our diet. And whether it's red or white, it's high in cholesterol. Whether it's red or white, it's relatively high in saturated fat. And it's the saturated fat that drives the cholesterol in the bloodstream. And so this is then the American diet. Please note, this is absolutely sh shocking. Over 50%, the yellow portion there of our calories that we eat every day, in America come from refined processed food. And then another 26 plus 9% of the calories that we eat comes from animal products, dairy and animal foods. And here's the key, only 14% of all the calories we eat, and some even suggest it's even less than that, only 14% of the foods that we eat calorie wise comes from fruits, vegetables, whole grains, 
and legumes like beans and uh, beans and lentils. Please note, nature's foods today assume a minimalistic role. Less than 14% of all the calories that we eat comes from these foods as grown, foods as they come in nature, whole foods. Whole foods today only represent 14% of the calories that we eat. So we are in a big, big change. And what is driving this uh, epidemic of heart disease? What is driving uh, these foods? Here's Michelle Simon. And she said, our diet-related disease epidemic, this heart disease and stroke and even cancer, is fueled by the powerful meat, dairy, and junk food industries supported by government policies that place profit above public health. So it's a very tempting dietary environment that we have, isn't it? Now let me take you to Loma Linda where I live here at Loma Linda University. Uh, we have conducted over the last uh, 60 years major research into the Adventist population. Adventists are fairly conservative Christian people. Uh, they are characterized by health emphasis. Uh, Adventists usually don't smoke. They don't usually use alcohol. Uh, they're quite often uh, open to consuming more water rather than uh, soft drinks. They're more into exercise and they're also very um, consistent in their church attendance. So they have a very good social network. So this group of people around the world is characterized by this homogeneous lifestyle, except people around the world in the Adventist church have different dietary patterns. Please note here, you can see that about 9 plus 31 plus 10, about 50% of the Adventist people around the world are basically vegetarians. The other 50% are uh, meat-consuming people. They're consuming dairy, they're consuming white and red meat and fish and so on. So let's take a look at this interesting population. Remember, they don't smoke, they don't usually use alcohol, they have... Uh, pretty consistent church attendance, they have good social networks, but they're different in their diets. Please note, about 9% of the Adventists are total vegetarians, they're vegans. About 31% of the Adventists are vegetarians, but they use some dairy and egg products. And 10% of the Adventists are vegetarians that use fish. So these are the vegetarians. And then you have about 50%, the rest are meat eaters. And the federal government came to them and said, we're very interested to see if diet, different diets have a different impact on these modern uh, killer diseases. And so they made millions and millions of dollars available. And the Adventist health study began, the number two health study began in 2002. They enrolled close to 100,000 Adventists in the United States and Canada. And they classified them all according to their dietary habits. They filled out long, long questionnaires, 50 pages full of questionnaires. They were very carefully followed with in terms of their hospitalizations, their diseases, and their deaths. And here's what they found. They found that when you look at the vegans on the left-hand side at the bottom there, when compared to the meat eaters, the red bar, you notice that the vegans over the next seven years, 1.6% of these vegans developed diabetes. And when it came to the uh, meat eating Adventist, 6.3% developed diabetes. That means there's a differential of 6.3 versus 1.6. That's 400%. Four times more of the Adventists in a seven year period developed diabetes. Meat eating versus vegan, four times differential. And please note the stepwise mm, progression. The further you go towards a pure vegetarian lifestyle, the less 
diabetes you have to worry about. The same thing is true for hypertension. Here, the differential, again, is four times. You have 19% of the Adventists develop, uh, the meat eaters develop uh, high blood pressure, while in the vegan group, only 5% develop high blood pressure problems, and everything else is in between. Cholesterol, similar. The meat eating Adventists have 15% that develop high cholesterol numbers that are being treated with medication. On the other hand, on the left side, you have only 3% of the total vegetarians, the vegans, that develop uh, a high cholesterol that would be treated by medication. So again, this is a five-fold differential just because of the diet differences. So the same thing is also true for weight. Adventist uh, meat eaters, on the average, weigh about 30 pounds more than the Adventist vegans. And so we can say, in summary, that it is estimated today by experts that probably up to 80% of our chronic disease and premature deaths could be prevented by making significant changes in diet and lifestyle. And so what I want to talk to you about or focus on is the question, what would happen if we applied these preventive lifestyle related strategies? I and mean, we can prevent this disease, right? What would happen if we applied this preventive strategy, a simple diet, no alcohol or very little, no uh, 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 smoking, and really being careful with sugar, salt, and fat? Could we influence these killer diseases if you already have it? Could you arrest it? Could you disarm it? Could you maybe even reverse heart disease? Let's take a look at this. <clears throat> so I want to focus on reversing heart disease and you do it with the instruments of hope, health and healing called fork and knife. Well, let's first talk a little bit about what do we do when we have the disease? Usually medically speaking, we have some wonderful tools that we can use when we have an acute disease, an infectious disease, an episodic disease. But when it comes to these chronic diseases, diseases that are developing over time, like atherosclerosis inside the arteries, when it comes to these diseases, the cures are very, very rare in the medical tool bag. I'll give you some example. You have heart disease, you think, well, if I just have that bypass surgery, everything is going to be all right. Well, wait a minute. Only 10% of the people that have bypass surgery, and there are about 500,000 every year in this country, only 10% will have their life extended by some time. Remember that when you take uh, a vein from the leg and you transfer it to the uh, coronary artery system, you stitch it in there to create a natural bypass Within two years, 40% of these vessels will have failed because the problem with these surgeries is that the arteries begin to narrow down again. The grafted vessel, in this case, the veins begin to clog up again. And uh, you haven't really taken care of the problem. You have just sort of bypassed the problem. And that's why Newsweek, you know, uh, 2011 had this big, big article, front page. You see this? One word that will save your life. What do you think it is? Two letters. The article, special health report, one word that will save your life. What do you think that word is? Any uh, idea? Uh, uh, prevention? Prevention, yeah. Um, one word that will save your life. That is kale. <laughs> say no. <laughs> say no to this procedure because there are better ways to handle it in most cases. And you say, well, we have angioplasties, we have stents that we can use. Well, here again, uh, many of these stents within six months are closed up again because, again, we have not solved the problem of eliminating the narrowing process, which is diet and lifestyle. So, then you say, well, but we have these drugs. They can take care of things, can't they? Well, they can help us. Uh, drugs can uh, take care of the pain that you experience from angina pain, from narrowed arteries. And then you also say, well, but what about these statin drugs? 
don't they bring the cholesterol down if cholesterol is the key factor with smoking and high blood pressure? If cholesterol is that much of a driver, we can just bring it down and everything's going to be fine. Well, again, wait a minute. Major articles have shown that when it comes to preventing heart disease with uh, statin drugs, these cholesterol-lowering drugs, they bring the cholesterol down, but it doesn't bring down the likelihood of developing heart disease. Here's the uh, the uh, editorial by the editor of the Journal of the American Medical Association she said, we can expect if we do the studies, we can expect, we can take 100 people, they have not had any heart disease. We take 100 men, we give them these drugs for five years at a cost of 200, $300,000. Five years, we give these medications, we drive the cholesterol down. And at the end of five years, among these 100 men, you may have expected you may have prevented one or two heart attacks. It doesn't work. And, as, and aside from this, you have a lot of side effects to worry about. 20% of the patients uh, will develop uh, special uh, muscle pains. And also the likelihood of diabetes and memory loss is uh, enhanced with these medications. So there's some problems. And then you say, well, you know, you mentioned that blood pressure, high blood pressure was one of the drivers of uh, atherosclerosis of heart disease. Well, we have some very excellent blood pressure pills. Yeah, we do. We can drive the blood pressure down, but it doesn't cure the problem. It doesn't cure the problem. It just makes you feel better, but it doesn't really solve the underlying problem. As a matter of fact, we are so accustomed in our society. We've been so almost, what shall I say, uh, we have uh, been given the notion that for every ill, there is a pill but nobody owns you wants to pay the bill, right? And even That's if it. you could pay the bill, the ill is not cured with a pill. The pill is only taking care of the symptoms because here you see prescription drugs are actually accountable and responsible for over 246,000 fatal side effects, which means prescription drugs are the number three cause of death in our society. 11% of all of our deaths are related to these prescription drugs. Please take a look there. Number three cause of death right after heart disease and uh, cancer and uh, strokes. We oftentimes uh, combine strokes and heart disease. So we have number one cause of death, cardiovascular disease, strokes and uh, Heart attacks, number one. Number two, cause of death, cancers. Number three, cause of death, prescription drugs. See, that's what we do. Take a look at this picture. What do you see there? Mop, mopping, I see mopping up the floor yes. without turning off the water. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it seems to be so obvious what we have to do, right? But no, we don't look for the causes. We're just mopping up, mopping up to keeping the floor dry. We're passing out umbrellas. You know, uh, you can see it on the right-hand side. The patient uh, gets an umbrella. Folks, this, these are the pills. The cause has to do with our lifestyle. And here again, we have to recognize that in our society, um, we are spending, take a look, the medical spending has gone up from 28 billion dollars in 1960 all the way up now to 2022 four almost four trillion dollars a tremendous increase that means that in 1960 we would spend five percent of our income on medical care today it would be 20 percent of our income and we're not living any longer this year than people a few years ago. It's changing. The new generation lives a shorter lifespan than the current generation. And please note, 86% of our medical costs, 86% of what we're spending as a society is being spent on managing the symptoms of these chronic diseases without turning them off. But we can if we take care of the problems. So I wanna spend a few minutes with you to talk to you about what we can do to actually uh, solve the underlying disease 
problem, our lifestyle. And I want to take you back to 1951. Major article appears in one of the best medical journals in the world, the Lancet Medical Journal, and they show that that the coronary deaths in Norway declined dramatically over the time years of the war. 1940, you see there, 1940, the Nazi armies came into Norway, occupied the country, took care of all the livestock to feed their own soldiers, and the people had to live on very, very simple food. And you see the line dropping. This is heart disease. This is cancer. This is diabetes. The diseases dropped precipitously until 1945. The war is over. People go back to their original diets. The Nazis are gone. The soldiers are gone, no longer taking their, their livestock. And you see the disease rates are climbing up very rapidly again and again. Diet and disease some powerful associations. We can take you to animal experiments. And that's what they did in 1965. They used animals and they fed them a typical American hospital diet. And they were able to produce the plaques in the arteries in fairly short order. And then they began to ask the question, now, if we take these monkeys, we create this atherosclerotic plaque as it is very similar to the human plaque. And then we remove the atherosclerotic um, stimulus. We don't give them the meat and the eggs and the cheese and the um, typical American diet now given to these monkeys. We would give them very simple monkey chow. What would happen to these monkeys? So they did more, many, many, many of these experiments and they found, can you believe it? As they sacrificed some monkeys to see what happened to the arteries in those days. They were absolutely astounded that they found that the arteries that had been filled with atherosclerotic plaque, now when they received a very simple diet, the arteries had begun to clear themselves out again. Now today we wouldn't have to sacrifice these monkeys, today we could do it with uh, new technology, so we wouldn't have to sacrifice these monkeys. But it proves the point that you can create this disease in many, many animal species by feeding them a typical American diet. What about humans? This is here now the Pritikin program. The Pritikin program uh, is a four week intensive uh, education program where people move towards a diet, a very simple diet of mostly whole foods and also uh, more um, of the plant-based foods. And you notice here, when I was the director of the Pritikin program, these are the results of a four-week program. Uh, we had uh, some uh, uh, 186 patients. Please note, the cholesterol dropped by 25% without any medication because we didn't have any medication in those days. This is the original data for the 1977. 25% drop in cholesterol. You say, well, big deal, what does that mean? That means a lot, because 25% drop in cholesterol means a 50% drop in coronary risk. What that means is, by lowering your cholesterol by 25%, you can cut the risk of a heart attack in half, 50% drop within four weeks, just by making some dietary changes. And you say, well, that's very interesting, um, but you know, I don't have the money to go to these live-in programs. I don't have the money to go to these clinics where you spend four weeks. Well, you can come to our CHIP program, the Complete Health Improvement Program, which is sort of an outpatient program where over four weeks, we really help you to change your diet in, ex in exchange uh, and in response to a very intensive education program. We give you about 19 lectures. You come four times a week. At least that's one of the programs that we run. And within four weeks, you can see the elevated cholesterol levels, the larger green arrow there, the cholesterol dropped by 20%. So we can change cholesterol levels very quickly within three to four weeks. Dr. Dean Ornish, um, came on the scene in the 1990s 
with an incredible story, an incredible study where he took 48 heart disease patients, half of the people he put into some kind of a pretty good type program of sort, you know, very simple diet, vegetarian diet, um, stress management, uh, exercise, no smoking. And after one year on following this kind of a program, he measured all these people again, the people that followed his program and the other group, the control group that followed the American Heart Association diet. Please note the green box there. You see the change in cholesterol there? This is within one year, 24% drop in cholesterol. You go a bit further down, you see 82% circled. 82% of the plaques, 80%, 82% of this narrowing processes had begun to diminish. The arteries began to open up and angina began to diminish in short order. This was a, this was a change in the paradigm. It was a change that signaled that maybe we ought to take a closer look at lifestyle medicine concepts where we teach people how to move towards a simpler diet, move towards whole foods, move towards more plant-based diets where you cut back on your sugar, you cut back on your salt and your fat and you move towards less and less and less and less. <clears throat> Along came Another physician by the name of Dr. Esselstyn at the famous Cleveland Clinic, here's what he found. Uh, he enrolled patients and uh, with heart disease. They'd already seen their cardiologists. They already had their bypass surgeries. They had their stents. Uh, they couldn't do any more for these patients as medical practitioners. He said, look, we've done the very best. You're on the best medication. You had the surgery. Uh, you had sometimes two times bypass surgery. You had multiple stents. Sometimes you had five, six, seven, eight, ten stents year after year after year. And yet the uh, arteries are closing up again. The grafted vessels are closing up again. And he said, I want to see if I can motivate these people to change their lifestyle. And when they do, if they bring their cholesterol down by natural means to 150 or less, I want to see if their, if their arteries begin to clear up again. And we can use now very sophisticated testing. We don't have to obviously sacrifice these people to look into their inside of the arteries. We can do it now in a very sophisticated manner. And he told them, I want you to eat a plant-based, very, very low fat, whole food diet. He didn't say anything about smoking. He didn't say anything about exercise. He said, I just want you to really try this one thing. I know that Dr. Ornish tried diet and exercise and stress management and no smoking. I want to see which of these intervention modalities is really the one that makes the biggest uh, benefit, give the biggest benefit. So Dr. Caldwell Esselstein at the famous Cleveland Clinic used a very simple diet of foods as grown. He fed them fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes he cut back on the dramatically on any fats and oils. He cut back on the sugars and he really cut back on the salts. And he basically gave them a very, very simple diet again of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. No eggs, no milk, no animal products. And here's what you see. This is just one of the patients. Um, you see on the left side, this is a, an angiogram, an x-ray of the coronary arteries, the arteries to the uh, heart, which were obstructed or narrowed down dramatically. You see the circled area, very little blood flow goes through there because it's narrowed down with these atherosclerotic plaques. And then he put these people on a very simple diet. That's all he did. And on the right-hand side, two and a half years later, you see the same artery, totally restored, blood, flowing very fully, blood flow restored, and angina pain actually had diminished within months. This is the power of making some lifestyle changes, particularly in the area of diet, to give the body a chance to heal itself. It's a marvelous type of a thing, empowerment of the body to heal. How do you lose so much weight? Uh, what kind of diet are you on? Well, <clears throat> My, uh, the short answer is 
I went on essentially a plant-based diet. I live on uh, uh, beans, legumes, vegetables, fruit, no dairy, and it changed my whole metabolism, and I lost 24 pounds, and I got back to basically what I weighed in high school. But I did it for a different reason. I mean, I wanted to lose a little weight, but I didn't ever dream this would happen. I did it because after I had this stent put in, I realized that even though it happens quite often that after you have bypasses, you lose the veins because they're thinner and weaker than arteries. The truth is that it clogged up, which means that the cholesterol was still calling buildup in my vein that was part of my bypass. And thank God I could take the stents. I don't want it to happen again. So I did all this research and I saw that 82% of the people since 1986 who have gone on a plant-based, no dairy, no meat of any kind, no chicken, turkey. If you can do it, 82% of the people who've done that have begun to heal themselves. Their arterial blockage cleans up. The calcium deposit around their heart breaks up. This movement has been led by a doctor named Caldwell Esselstein at the Cleveland Clinic, Dean Ornish, whom you know, out in California. The doctors Campbell, father and son, who wrote the China study, and a handful of others. But we now have 25 years of evidence. And so I thought, well, since I need to lose a little weight for Chelsea's wedding, I'll become part of this experiment. I'll see if I can be one of those that can have a self-clearing mechanism. Well, isn't it amazing? Isn't that really amazing? I mean, here is a former president who was not known to be really a, a purist when it comes to simple foods, right? I mean, <laughs> he was a junk food uh, junkie. I mean, uh, he knew every uh, fast food place uh, near Washington there. And yet, if the president can do it, and he has made a very solid commitment now for the last six, seven years, uh, you know, after his bypass uh, failed and the stents, uh, you know, he was... Uh, becoming more and more aware that stents don't provide the answer because they clog up again often very, very quickly. He became now a believer in this kind of a lifestyle medicine approach. And, uh, you know, he, he studied the books by Dr. Uh, Ornish. He studied the books by Dr. Colbert Zasselstein. Um, and there are many, many new books out now by Dr. Greger, How Not to Die. Um, you know, you have written books, I've written some books, uh, and uh, here's Dr. Esselstein, uh, he summarizes it up in his uh, article in the American Journal of Cardiology, he said, the stents and the bypass surgeries, they may have their place when you have an emergency, you know, sometimes you need to do that, but for the vast majority of patients, he said, these interventions are not as effective as a very low-fat, whole food, plant-based diet. Hello? That sounds like you, doesn't it? Absolutely. It's what I eat. It's what I recommend. Well, you've been recommending that for years. Yeah, 43 years. Yeah, you took care of yourself in your own situation, right? You bet. And you are writing books. As a matter of fact, I just, I just received uh, one of your books uh, in German. The book is now in Germany. So, I mean, I'm just really, really proud of what you're doing, helping my own people, because, you know, I have German roots. Uh, I had just my book, uh, Health Power, published in German with two of my colleagues there. Uh, it's doing very, very well. And so we are in the same market, trying to give the same message to help the people there to turn lives around. So when it comes to heart disease, you know, uh, there's nothing more important in the lifestyle mm, uh, toolbox than a very simple diet. Here's Dr. Blum, she wrote, changing the food you eat is a single most powerful lifestyle change you can make to restore your health. Reversing heart disease, restoring health. You can do it with fork and knife. Attack is just waiting to happen. More than a million heart attacks a year. That's one 
just about every 30 seconds. A new report from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says 200,000 deaths from heart disease and stroke could be avoided each year. Every year, half a million Americans undergo coronary bypass, and over a million more have angioplasty or a stent procedure. Do you know the secrets to reversing your heart disease? They're simpler than you think. has studied and written about diet and heart disease for decades. This man is one of my heroes. I have been following him since I was a resident. He is the very doctor who turned the medical community on its ear with his groundbreaking findings on the heart. The doctor and the program that has healed thousands of hearts. You've seen results in seven days. Your body has a remarkable capacity to begin healing itself. Because your body is trying to help you out. <laughs> For over 20 years, Dr. Dean Ornish has been making headlines as the first doctor to prove that heart disease can really be reversed by changing your lifestyle. <laughs> and to think that something as simple as a fork and knife can lead the way towards a recovery from heart disease, where we usually invest millions of dollars. I mean, you have a bypass, that's $150,000. And only in 10% of the cases can we actually demonstrate that people live longer. We spend $20,000, $30,000 on a stent. And, you know, if it's for an emergency, of course, it can save your life. But this is not the answer. Uh, we can do something to maintain and arrest, to maintain our health, to arrest the evolving disease, to, um, to turn it around and to become a new person again. You can actually reverse this disease process by getting into the arteries through the diet that we uh, use, which is when you recommend, uh, you recommend a diet that is uh, high in nutritional value, it's high in nutrition, it's inexpensive, um, it's food as it comes in nature, um, it's low in calories, uh, you can eat all you want and you can actually, to a large extent, uh, uh, maintain your weight quite nicely and even lose weight if you have to, uh, you can bring your cholesterol down. You can bring your triglycerides down all within weeks. You can do something about um, your uh, smoking. You can do something about your high blood pressure. Uh, people don't need to be on high blood pressure medication. If you have moderately high blood pressure problems, usually you have a very excellent uh, opportunity to take care of this by making some dietary changes. Number one, number two, get an exercise program. And number three, begin to shed excess weight. So recommendations, what do we recommend? What would you recommend, AJ? I would recommend a plant exclusive diet free of sugar, oil, and salt. But I know that might be too extreme for some people. Well, I think that's the goal that we should have. That's what we try to aim for in our CHIP program, the Complete Health Improvement Program. We have about, um, well, we have about 100,000 graduates from our program. And what we do, we help them to move in that direction. That's our goal. Why don't you tell us again what you recommend, what is ideal? I recommend a plant exclusive diet free of all processed foods and specifically sugar, oil, and salt. No problem, that's where I'm at. However, you sometimes have to start where the people are and you begin to move them forward in the right direction. I can tell you one thing we need to do for sure. Let's take a look at the next slide. We need to have a new cow. <laughs> I mean, the old cow is out, I mean, uh, we just can't afford all the saturated fat and the cholesterol and the lack of fiber uh, that the animal foods represent. You know, this comes here from uh, Amtrak. 
I found this in an Amtrak magazine. This is not just some kind of a weird idea that some uh, fanatical vegans have developed. No, this is becoming more and more the responsible and the intelligent choice of people who understand that we are in charge, we are in charge of our own health. And these are people that also begin to realize that there are ethical issues attached to this here, right? I mean, is it really okay to kill 1 million animals every hour in this country so that we can use our stomachs as the graveyards of these beautiful beasts? Is that really, are there some ethical questions to be raised? How about ecological issues here? Aren't these some real issues that we're wrestling with today? People talk about climate change. People talk about uh, greenhouse gases. The number one contributor to the greenhouse gases today is livestock. Probably over 50% of the greenhouse gases are the direct result of the livestock industry. We are a planet in survival mode. Maybe we ought to think differently. Maybe we ought to adopt this cow that you see there as having a lot to offer in many areas of our lives. And so here is uh, where we see ourselves in our CHIP program. Uh, we see ourselves uh, that when you have on the left side a diet, the typical American diet that's high in meats and dairy, eggs and processed foods, alcohol and caffeine. When you have this kind of a diet, you usually have on the left hand side top there, disease progression the worst of health outcomes. Disease relates to a diet that is largely related to meats, dairy, eggs, processed foods, alcohol, and caffeine. This is a typical American diet, especially when you don't exercise and you smoke and you have other issues to deal with, stress and so on. You are sitting duck for these modern killer diseases. On the other hand, if you begin to move towards the right-hand side, you cut back on these red uh, triangular foods there. You cut back on your meats and your dairy and your eggs, processed foods, big time, all caffeine, and you move towards the right-hand side. Now you're beginning to eat more fruits and vegetables, more whole grains, eat more legumes like beans and lentils. You may have perhaps some nuts and seeds, um, and you drink lots of water. You combine this with a good exercise program. You... Uh, develop a, a social network, you feel comfortable there, you feel uh, integrated, and uh, you are now living a purpose-driven life. Everything changes. You have some spiritual reasons for being around, and uh, you see your greatest uh, uh, joy in becoming uh, of service to other people. Service first. This is a very different lifestyle than what we practice today that we're driven into by our society. This is then the diet that I think you would be very, very comfortable with. This is a diet that we recommend. Lots of water, eight, 10 glasses of water a day. Uh, we cannot get enough hydration, especially now with the uh, virus situation. More fruits, uh, more vegetables, uh, you know, uh, some whole grain breads, some whole grain cereals and uh, lots of beans. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, when you do this, you're not only reversing potentially the heart disease, the atherosclerotic plaque in your arteries, but you also now have a very powerful tool as Dr. Dean Ornish has shown that can affect certain cancers like prostate cancer. They can um, affect your type two diabetes. Uh, you can actually begin to turn this type two diabetes around within three to four weeks and sometimes less you will see within a week's time when you have these high fiber foods like you see here plant-based whole food diets you will see within a week's time blood sugar levels dropping stop they're dropping step by step by step and before you know it your physician has to actually reduce the medication your physician may have to reduce the insulin all within a week two and three weeks time. The power of food is just absolutely amazing. And so 
what we have tried to talk about today is we have talked about that fork and knife are actually weapons of mass destruction. Yeah, not only this country where every third death is due to cardiovascular disease and where these diseases have now become center point worldwide. 30, 40 years ago, you didn't have heart disease in China. 30, 40 years ago, you didn't have heart disease in Ethiopia. 30, 40 years ago, you didn't have these diseases in other developing countries. Today, they're rampant because, I mean, I just came back from Fiji, from the Fiji Islands. And uh, they mentioned to me that 50 years ago, it was difficult to find any kind of a case of diabetes. Type 2 diabetes, adult onset diabetes was unknown on the Fiji Islands in the South Pacific. When I was there, 40% of the adults over 40 years have diabetes. I talked to the, uh, to the uh, CEO of the country. I talked to the president and he said, you know, Hans, um, people walk into the hospital. They get into the hospital with two feet. They come out of the hospital without legs because of the diabetes. I mean, he said, we need to do something. We need to stop this disease. We cannot afford to provide medications that don't really cure the problem. We cannot cut off feet and legs and amputations um, because that makes it oftentimes is the last resort of what to do with our diabetic population. We need to do something earlier. We need to prevent this disease and people that have it we need to reverse it by moving towards a diet that we used to have 30, 40, 50 years ago here on the islands. Simple foods like fresh fruits and vegetables and whole grains and lots of those tubers, you know, potatoes and uh, these starchy tubers that they used to have. Uh, these are the kind of foods, lots of beans and lentils. These are the foods we used to have and we were healthy people. Today, we are in big, big trouble. And so, the answer then is to use fork and knife in a different manner and to make the fork and knife instruments of hope, health, and healing because we can reverse these chronic diseases by attacking the causes, by reaching out to our lifestyle. And as we do, it's amazing. The body responds very rapidly, which then motivates you to stay on the program you know, we have many, many people. We have close to 100,000 CHIP graduates. You know, nobody's going to easily go back to their previous lifestyle because they don't want to give up how good they feel, free of medication in many, many cases. New people living full lives, abundant lives. And that's what we wish all of those that are listening in and viewing this program. Blessings to all of you. And uh, maybe you have a question or two, AJ, we have a couple of minutes left, right? Yeah, if you want, you could take it off screen share. And their questions have been posted and it goes so fast, I don't always see them, but I know I saw one from Deborah about, is familial hyper, hyper, hypertension the same as just regular hypertension? Well, familiar suggests that it runs in families. Uh, um, I sometimes have some uh, issue with that terminology because I think we make the assumption that these chronic diseases like heart disease and the stroke and uh, cancer and high blood pressure, they're genetically um, passed on. But you know, while they run in from generation to generation, it's not only that we pass on the genes from the grandparents to the parents to the kids, but we're also passing on the recipes of the previous generation. And so uh, we also know now from genetic research that we can uh, uh, actually suppress the genetic expression towards a disease. We can change it. We can change it within weeks. That's incredible. Well, here's an interesting question from Ian. What's better, butter or margarine? Well, it depends on, you want to be hanged or do you want to be shot? None of these is really an ideal food. 
And I think it's best if we cut back on both of those. Of course, AJ is very strong when she talks about no fats, no oils. And I think this is an idea that we should move towards to more and more and more. And when you do, the benefit's all yours. Well, you know that with your patients, with your people, with your clients, right? Absolutely. There's comments from Gina that you're very handsome. And I've also been posting the link to the CHIP program. And I love what you said, a pill for every ill and no one wants to pay the bill. That is great. I've not heard you say that before. That's funny. Yeah. It is, it's sad, sadly so, right? We think that the answer comes in the magic potion, but the magic is really within. It's in here. It's between the ears, right? Right. Well, that Flatlander wants to ask you, why do you think salt is not so good? We consume about 10 times more sodium salt than the body needs as a minimum. So we are in a society where uh, we are consuming excessive amounts of salt. And when you take these large amounts of salt, the sodium uh, is kind of harmful to the body. And so the body begins to retain water to dilute the salt that is inside the, the, the body. And so that's how you then actually gain weight. You can hold five, 10, 12, pounds of extra water in the body because of the sodium that the body wants to dilute. So sodium is not in our best interest. And I think we need to get back to at least cutting it in half, at least. That's great, terrific. And the last question, what does Dr. Deal think of the keto diet? The keto diet works very well, short term, and then it bites you. You have actually mortgaged your long-term health on the altar of short-term benefits. It's not a natural diet. It still doesn't take care of the ethical issues, still doesn't take care of the uh, ecological issues, still doesn't take care of uh, the uh, many concerns that we have when you have a diet that is high in animal products. And uh, uh, you know they do one thing right for sure, and that is they're really cutting back on the uh, refined processed foods, right? Right? Absolutely. But Market your health. Keto diet works well for one thing only, and that is if you have some seizure situation, there's something that happens there. But all the other things, you have short term benefits where you mortgage your long term health on the altar of some short term benefits. It's not recommended and it's not wise ecologically, economically, and any other way. That's beautiful. Yeah, mortgage the health in the long term just for a few transitory benefits in the short term. Well, people really enjoyed your presentation, Dr. Deal. As always, you're articulate, you're passionate, and we love having you as a guest. Well, thank you. It's a privilege being on your show. Thank you so much. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. when we'll be doing a joint Q&A with psychologist Dr. Doug Lyle and Dr. Jen Hawk. Take care, everybody, and blessings to you, Hans. Thank you.